I'm going to read from the Bhagavad Gita as usual. This is a lecture about faith. If someone can't hear, let us know. It seems to be. Can everyone hear? Raise your hands if you can hear. Can you hear Krishna Balaram? And everyone understands English? Raise your hand if you understand English. You. That's you. What's that? Okay. Krishna Balaram, entiendes inglés? Krishna Balaram. Puedes entender inglés? Sí? Bueno. Okay, so this is a verse we're going to read. Something from the, uh, well, let me just line this up here. Let me begin with reading from Bhagavad Gita 440. So if you have a Bhagavad Gita, you can turn to 440. Agyas chasradhanas cha samshayatma vinashiti nanam lokasthina paro nasukam samshayatma ha. But ignorant and faithless persons who doubt the revealed scriptures do not obtain God consciousness. They fall down. For the doubting soul, there is happiness neither in this world nor in the next. Hmm. Oh, people, yeah, a lot. Let's see, guys. So, sorry, I need to stop the camera. Uh, otherwise, I cannot uh, hear you if the breaking in the um, connection. Okay, no problem. If your connection isn't good and you have to stop the camera, better to stop the camera. I think we lost some devotees there. Okay, this, this is the purport. But ignorant and faithless persons who doubt the revealed scriptures do not attain God consciousness. For the doubting soul, there is happiness neither in this world nor in the next. Purport. Out of many standard and authoritative revealed scriptures, the Bhagavad Gita is the best. Persons who are almost like animals have no faith in or knowledge of the standard revealed scriptures. And some, even though they have knowledge of or can cite passages from the revealed scriptures, have actually no faith in these words. And even though others may have faith in scriptures like Bhagavad Gita, they do not believe in or worship the personality of Godhead, Sri Krishna. Such persons cannot have any standing in Krishna consciousness. They fall down. Out of all the above mentioned persons, those who have no faith and are always doubtful make no progress at all. Men without faith in God and his revealed word find no good in this world nor in the next. For them there is no happiness whatsoever. One should therefore follow the principles of revealed scriptures with faith and thereby be raised to the platform of knowledge. Only this knowledge will help one become promoted to the transcendental platform of spiritual understanding. In other words, doubtful persons have no status whatsoever in spiritual emancipation. One should therefore follow the footsteps of greater charyas of the disciples of succession and thereby obtain success. <clears throat> so again, the verse is, but ignorant and faithless persons do not obtain God consciousness. But ignorant and faithless persons who doubt the revealed scriptures do not obtain God consciousness, they fall down. For the doubting soul, there is happiness neither in this world nor in the next. Krishna and the Bhagavad Gita had begun the seventh chapter, which is the chapter which deals with the process of developing Krishna consciousness or bhakti, devotional service, with the verse 
Maya Sakta Manak Partha Yogam Yunjan Manashaya Asamashayam Samagramam Yatagya Sasi Tatschanu. Here from Yo Sanapritta, how by practicing yoga in full consciousness of me, with mind attached to me, you can know me in full free from doubt. In other words, uh, what is doubt? What, what doubts are we trying to get free from? Uh, the main doubt, well, we have, generally we have three doubts. We have more than three doubts, but anyhow, there are three main categories and they can be explained in different ways. One of them is we doubt that we're eternal, which is quite a problem. Especially when you are eternal and you don't know you're eternal, uh, then it's quite confusing. It's quite, it puts into a lot, puts us into unnecessary anxiety, namely that we're going to die. Now, since we're not going to die, that's really a problem. Now, if we died, it wouldn't be such a problem because then we have to worry about it after we die. The real problem is that because we're eternal and then we die and then we come back in another body and then we worry about dying again. So we spend eternity worrying about dying, but we never die. So that's quite difficult. Of course, luckily we get a rest. Big rest. After 311 trillion, 40 billion years of Brahma's life, when everything is destroyed, we go to sleep for 311 trillion, 40 billion years. And then we don't worry about anything. And then we wake up and we spend the next 311 trillion, 40 billion years just worrying that we're going to die, although we never die. So that's a problem. We should get rid of that doubt as soon as possible and realize that we're eternal. Second thing is we think that there's something going on other than Krishna is what's arranged by Krishna. So that's also a problem. Because even if we're eternal, and even if we understand that we're an illusion eternally and that we should get out of it, still, if we think that there's some non-benevolent benevolent force which is ruling the universe or that the universe is out of control or that there's something impersonal running the universe and therefore I'm being unfairly or unreasonably treated in my everyday experiences either because the person who's in charge shouldn't be in charge or that the person who's in charge hasn't really got full control of things and therefore people who shouldn't be in charge are now in charge. So many different speculations. There is even one rab, rab, rabbi, his name was Krishna. By him. And this rabbi Krishna, he had a theory that actually God is a nice person. Unfortunately, he's become very old. And because he's become very old, he's become senile. And because he's become senile, he can't quite control the universe as he used to. And therefore, he's having trouble getting things together. And for that reason, bad things are happening to good, good people. And good things are happening to bad people. But according to his theory, we shouldn't worry, because after some time, God will, certainly, will finally retire. And then one of the better angels will take over, and things will go properly. So that's one speculation. Now that doubt will always put us in anxiety unless we understand that who Krishna is and how powerful he is and that he's making arrangements at every moment for our own benefit, that there's no one Krishna is not trying to benefit. It's not that Krishna saw my face and he doesn't like my face, so he's giving happiness to everyone else and he's causing me trouble. No, Krishna like, loves everyone, and he's equal to everyone. It's up to us what we do and what results we get. But whatever we, results we get, Krishna is still going to encourage us by those, those results, whether good or bad, to eventually take shelter of him, eventually get free from our doubts and take shelter of him. He's not doing, he, he's not doing anything in this world simply to without any reasoning behind it, to put people into misery. The misery is an impetus for them to take shelter of Krishna. As a matter of fact, when we see someone in a very prominent position, 
and then they have spiritual difficulty, we shouldn't think that Krishna has been unkind to them. But because the basis of spiritual advancement is humility, and Krishna wants them to advance, therefore he puts them in a position where they ha they're forced to become humble and therefore begin their spiritual progress anew. We should understand that at every moment, everywhere, all the time, eternally, Krishna simply wants us to make spiritual progress and go back to Godhead. If he puts us into difficulty in some way or another, it's simply for our benefit to inspire us to take shelter of him. And if he gives us some facility by which we can perform our devotional service better, then Krishna is simply encouraging us to become more productive in our service to him. Now, the reason why we're hearing the scripture is because the scripture comes from Krishna. And although we may not be able to perceive Krishna's other opulences as clearly, or so clearly, such as his beauty, uh, those who are very advanced, they may be able to perceive the beauty of the Lord in his deity form to some degree, but they may not see Krishna as the original Shaima Sundar in his deity form. Similarly, one may acknowledge that Krishna owns everything, but unless we can see at every moment how Krishna is controlling the universe, we may not understand fully his, the extent of his ownership. Similarly, we may accept that Krishna is very strong, but we may not see him lifting over Don Hill, and we may not recognize him as the one who's bringing the sun up in the morning and having the sun come down in the evening. We don't necessarily see that Krishna is the one who's doing it, although with a little bit of intelligence, we should understand that someone's doing it. And according to the Brahma Samhita, if we have any faith in Lord Brahma, which we probably don't even know who, you know, we, we haven't met Lord Brahma, but anyhow, he, he, he sings very nicely, Lord Brahma. He makes nice verses. Uh, they can't be some ordinary person who just happened to write perfect Sanskrit verses and about Krishna. He had nothing else to do. One day he just sat down and decided to make some, you know, around 100 Sanskrit verses with 100 books, all glorifying Krishna. And uh, actually he had, didn't even know if Krishna existed or not. And just happened to write perfectly intelligently. For instance, Lord Brahma says, it's chaksha esha savitasa kalagrahanam, rajasamasa suramurti ashe shateja, yes yagaya brahmati samrita kala chakra, govindam adi purusham tamahang bhujami. So Lord Brahma says he's worshiping Krishna not because he has nothing else to do, sitting on the lotus flower for so long, getting bored picked out a name from a box and said, Krishna decided to worship him. <laughs> Nothing better to do out here. Now he's worshiping because he says that the sun is his eye. The sun, which is giving unlimited heat and light at every moment, is the eye of the Supreme Lord. If the sun came a little closer to the earth, everything would be burnt. And if the sun went a little further away from the earth, everything would freeze. But the sun is perfectly fixed in an orbit. Although the sun is so powerful that it's the controlling deity of the, all the other planets, still it cannot move one inch beyond its orbit. Just like a bull in India, they attach a bull to, by its nose to a pole, and then the bull walks around a the pole pulling a very heavy, heavy weight in order to crush grain. So though the bull is so powerful, it can pull a heavy weight that 50 men would have a hard time pulling. Still, it cannot move one inch beyond the rope. Similarly, although the, soul is, the sun is full of infinite effulgence and power, still it doesn't move one inch beyond its orbit. So the question is, someone put it there. Someone put the sun in its orbit. Someone put all the planets in the orbit. Krishna claims it's him. 
now it must be someone. Now someone else may claim it's me. Well, that's very nice, because like I met someone who told me one time, he's moving all the planets in their orbits. So he said, well, that's very good. You know, it's a little cold today. Do you think you can just brighten the sun a little bit more? I mean, it would really help. He said, I could, but I don't want to. I said, well, maybe you can move, have the moon come up a little bit earlier today. It would be nice to see that. He said, I could, but I don't want to. I said, well, what do you want to do? He said, well, that's up to me what I want to do. In other words, he, couldn't do, he wouldn't do anything, but he, cl- he wanted to claim he was everything. So, of course, we can't see Krishna moving the sun, but someone is doing it. Similarly, as far as renunciation, or as, as far as fame, these are qualities that, that are claimed that Krishna has unlimitedly. But what we can perceive is by reading his book, hearing his instructions, either hearing Bhagavad Gita directly or hearing from his devotees what their realizations they have of Bhagavad Gita, then we can, un- we can understand whether Krishna's knowledge is perfect or not. And if Krishna's knowledge is perfect, it was applicable 5,000 years ago, and it's just as applicable now, then we can understand that Krishna must have unlimited knowledge. Now, in Bhagavad Gita, Krishna doesn't tell us who's going to win the Kentucky Derby this year. I don't know if you know what the Kentucky Derby is. But, and it's a horse race, and people bet a lot of money on it. It doesn't say in Bhagavad Gita, you can read Bhagavad Gita day and night trying to figure out who's going to win the Kentucky Derby and it won't help you. Because it doesn't deal with that. Of course, maybe if you read Bhagavad Gita day and night, you met Krishna, etc. And you asked him, he might tell you, or he might not tell you. In any case, the Bhagavad Gita is not meant to tell, tell, to get us involved in things outside of the topics that Krishna thinks are important. And what Krishna thinks are important are three things. Again, that we're eternal, because that's where he begins in Bhagavad Gita, that to realize that we're eternal. The process to realize that we're eternal, namely karma yoga, jnana yoga, stanga yoga, and who he is, Krishna. And the process of realizing Krishna, namely bhakti yoga. That's all Krishna deals with in Bhagavad Gita. But he deals with it in such a way as to convince us that these things are perfect. His knowledge is perfect about the soul, about the process of realizing the soul, and the process of understanding Krishna and who Krishna is. Now, if we're not interested in those topics, then there's no reason to read Bhagavad Gita. There's no reason to perform devotional service because no matter how much we perform devotional service, we still may not win the Kentucky Derby. We still not be, may become famous ourselves or, we, or wealthy or, or healthy or whatever else we want to become. But the only purpose of reading Bhagavad Gita is to understand who we are, who Krishna is, and how we can realize Krishna, how we can meet Krishna. Now, in this particular verse that I read, it is mentioned that there are people who don't accept the revealed scriptures to different degrees. They're there, Kali Yuga, of course, even people who are so-called, well, many people are just completely agnostic or atheistic, or as Prabhupada said, philosophical, apparently. Uh, they come in contact with something called scriptures, and to some degree they may be scripture, but they may not be conclusive enough to, or they may not be consistent enough. They may not be uh, clear clear enough to, or they may not have give the clear enough process by which one can actually realize the purpose of the scripture, which is to understand Krishna. Therefore, people, Sometimes, it's, it's a, probably breaks it down here, that there are three classes of people. In general, there are more than three classes of people, of course, who have doubt to reveal scripture. But he says, out of the many standard and revealed scriptures, 
Bhagavad Gita is the best. Because everyone says our scripture is the best, but we say it's the best also, why not? If everyone else can say it, why can't we? So the lowest class of people, Prabhupada said, are people who are persons who are almost like animals, who have no faith in or knowledge of standard revealed scriptures. Uh, this is probably most of the people in the world today. Uh, they have no idea of even the first verse of the Bhagavad Gita. Probably they never heard it. And if they heard it, they probably didn't take it very seriously. Namely, that our bodies are changing, but we're not changing. Now, if we actually believe that we're changing along with this body, then the only thing left is to eat, sleep, mate, and defend. There's nothing else to do. Because if we're a body, then either we're going to neglect the body and we'll starve it to death and die and have to get the next one, or we're going to fully engage in, in serving the senses or to some degree or another. But it's more or less animal life. The only alternative to spiritual life is eating, sleeping, mating, and defending. There's nothing else to do. We may do it in a very sophisticated way, in a, in a way which is more in the mode of goodness or more in the mode of passion rather than the mode of ignorance, but it's still the same thing. Whether you eat with a fork or you eat with your claws, it's, it's not a big difference. The eating is there. And if you don't wash your, your hands before you eat with your, with your hands or with a fork, or if you don't clean the fork, you're more likely to get sick than the animal will. Because the animal is more likely to wash his hands before he eats. Or if he doesn't wash his hands, it probably won't make a difference because he has a, probably a better fire digestion than we have. And they only eat what's Ayurvedically recommended for their body. You never find an animal like a tiger eating halava. Matter of fact, tigers don't eat sweets, so therefore Ayurvedically, they should be quite well. But human beings, they can deviate from their prescribed diet. Now the next class of faithless men, some have knowledge of, or can cite passages from the revealed scriptures, have actually no faith in these words. So that's the class of people, they memorize scripture. We see in Shul Prabhupada's morning walks in Bombay, there was one doctor, his name was Dr. Capel, no, what was his name? Do you remember the doc name of that doctor? There was a doctor in the morning walks, and he would always challenge Prabhupada, quoting Bhagavad Gita. Whatever Prabhupada said, he would challenge him. Well, it's in Bhagavad Gita, it says. So he knew the Bhagavad Gita from heart, but he didn't know anything about the Bhagavad Gita. Just like a parrot, you can teach a parrot to, to, to learn the scriptures probably better than we can. Probably want a Bhagavad Gita. <laughs> And it'll quote exactly whatever you tell it in any language. Even if it doesn't understand the language, it'll quote in that language of the Bhagavad Gita, but it won't understand anything. One time in Dallas, I was there and Shri Prabhupada was hearing from some of the Gurukul students, them reciting Bhagavad Gita, because as I said before, there was a contest every week Anyone who could memorize the Bhagavad Gita, a whole chapter, we get the Maha play. And although I wasn't a member of the Dallas Temple, but I would visit there, especially when, the, when, when they were having the contest, so I can get some prasadam, the Maha play. We're from the deities, right, at Kalachandri. It's quite good. The other prasadam wasn't quite up to that standard. In any case, so every week there was a competition, and you'd recite a whole chapter from Bhagavad Gita, and the next week, in order to get the Maha plate, you had to just recite chapter one and then chapter two the next week. And so it was a fierce competition. By the 18th week, you would have to know the whole Bhagavad Gita to get the Maha plate. You'd have to recite it for two hours because you'd get pretty hungry by that time. But if you didn't get it, then it was, it was a good spiritual experience, but you we went hungry. So there were two devotees two Gurukul students, one was named Leela Smarna, who was expert at reciting the Bhagavad Gita. 
So every week he'd get the, they'd get the the maha play between them. And they were presented before Ashul Prabhupada. It was around 1975, I believe. And Prabhupada, Shul Prabhupada was in Dallas and they were reciting the, the Bhagavad Gita from the first chapter, Dharma, Shetra, Kurukshetra. And they went on and on. And finally, Shul Prabhupada stopped and said, so what does it mean? And they looked at Prabhupada like, you know, they never asked us to find out what it meant. They just told us to memorize it, you know. If we memorized what it, what it meant, we wouldn't have gotten the Maha play. So. And Prabhupada said, no, it's useless. You know, a para could do the same thing. You had to know the meaning also. So there are some people who know the scriptures, but they don't know what they mean. They have no faith in the words because they don't know what they mean. And if they know what they mean, they don't really know what they mean. Then the last class probably mentions, even those who have faith in the scriptures like Bhagavad Gita, they did not believe in the worship of this personality of Godhead, Sri Krishna. Such persons cannot have any standing in Krishna consciousness. They fall down. So even though they may follow karma yoga, jnana yoga, astanga yoga, if they don't believe in Krishna, who he is, then they'll be attracted by material energy. Even they come to the Brahman platform, they come to the pure goodness, still, without the taste of Krishna consciousness, without developing love for Krishna, they'll fall down into material existence again. But Prabhupada doesn't see them all as equally. He says, out of all the mentioned persons, those who have no faith and are always doubtful, make no progress at all. Men without faith in God and his re revealed work, word find no good in this world, nor in the next. For them there is no happiness whatsoever. Therefore one should follow the principles of revealed scripture with faith and thereby raise, be raised to the platform of knowledge. Shul Prabhupada wrote these books, translated them, and gave us his purpose so we should read them. He didn't want us just to sell them or hopefully at least have a copy so that our friends will see that we're actually good devotees of Krishna because we have a copy of Bhagavad Gita or something that shows that we're faithful devotees. Although we don't know what's inside of them, but we like the picture on the outside. No, we have to read these books regularly. We have to hear from Krishna and we have to hear from Krishna as if Krishna was talking to us personally. It's not some dry philosophy. Krishna spoke 5,000 years ago and trying to keep Arjuna awake and, 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 and paying attention because Arjuna at the end thought, well, what is this all about? You know, why don't you teach me something practical like the martial arts or something? You know, I, I'm about to fight a war. What has this got to do? You know, bhakti, love. What is it? You want me to develop love? <laughs> I'm going to kill people out here. Should I do it lovingly? Is that what you want? No, actually, Krishna was speaking to Arjuna that if one becomes fixed in our relation with Krishna and act according to Krishna's desires, then the result is that everything will become clear, whatever we're doing. Even if we're fighting on the battle of Kurukshetra, we're fighting in everyday life. So this knowledge is in Bhagavad Gita, although it may appear to be rather philosophical or whatever we may consider it. Still, it's actually Krishna speaking personally to us so that we can change our activities and so we can change our consciousness so that we'll realize we're eternal. So that we'll realize that we're eternally servants of Krishna. We can't escape Krishna no matter what we do, no matter how much we try to forget him. We're 100%, 24 hours, seven days a week, 365 point something days a year, eternally dependent on Krishna. The only question is whether we want to realize our dependency from hearing from Krishna and his representatives, hearing Bhagavad Gita, Srimad Bhagavatam, and have it explained by his representatives so we, to help us understand what Krishna is saying. The representatives of Krishna don't explain it so that they can surpass Krishna. Their only aim is to help us understand what our relation with Krishna is 
what Krishna is talking to us, not only in Bhagavad Gita, not only in the words of the sadhus or in the guru, but Krishna in our heart, what he's trying to tell us. Ultimately, it's Paramatma who's trying to help us. And he sent his representatives, namely Guru Sana Shastra, so we can hear better what he's saying in our heart. And if we think we've understood Guru Sadhana Shastra and we can't hear Krishna, then we probably better get some spiritual hearing aid so we can hear a little bit more internally. Now, there's more to be said, of course, about anything like this, but so faith can be divided into three different levels. And I won't go into the details in this class about the different levels of faith. But eligibility to develop our faith depends on certain different criteria. And that criteria is faith ultimately in scripture. Now, one who studies scripture and put it into practice, then gradually they become more and more eligible for pure devotional service. That eligibility for pure devotional service begins really or becomes solidified at the stage of what's called nishta. So nishta it's not very complicated. Nishto Brahma Bhuta platform, as Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, Brahma Bhuta Prasanatma, Nishoshiti Nakangshiti, Samaksarveshu Bhuteshu, Bhagbhaktin Labhate Param. That one comes to the Brahma Bhuta stage, or one realizes one is eternal, then the result is that one feels a kind of relief from all one's anxieties, a kind of joyfulness. And what is that a result of? And not hankering and not lamenting. And being able to see everyone as Krishna's eternal servant and try to help them see as one's duty to try to see what one can do in order to help them realize their eternality, their relation with Krishna, etc. Then one can see everyone equally. Equally, not that everyone is the same, but see with an equal service attitude towards everyone. That one is the servant of the servant of the servant of Krishna. Then one can begin the process of actual serving with pure devotion for Krishna. That is the best qualification to come to the Brahma Bhuta platform. That's the best eligibility for pure devotional service. As Krishna says, he can enter into the devotional service and Bhakti Mama Bijananti. One can understand me as the Supreme Personality of Godhead only by that devotional service. And by such devotional service, one can enter into the mysteries of my understanding. Now, if we look at the nectar of devotion, namely, I believe it's chapter three. I don't really, I, do I have that here? No, I don't have it here. Oh, chapter three, yes. Eligibility for, pure, for the candidate for accepting devotional service. So lo and behold, the, the eligibility is come to the Brahma Buddhist platform. There, we can start with those who have no faith in the scripture, the neophyte devotee. Now, of course, if we call someone a neophyte devotee, they'll get very insulted probably report me to the GBC body. But neophyte is not such a bad new word, Kanista Adhikar. It's like calling someone, if you say someone's a demon, they'll get very upset. If you call them a sura, they won't know what you're talking about. Although they're both a demon and a sura, probably better to call them an asura. So neophyte, or the third class of Odi, is one whose faith is not strong, who at the same time does not recognize the decision of the revealed scriptures. The neophyte's faith can be changed by someone else's strong arguments or by an opposite decision. Unlike the second class devotee who also cannot put forward arguments and evidences from the revealed scriptures, but it still has all faith in the objective, the neophyte has no firm faith in the objective. Thus he is called the neophyte devotee. So what is, there are four classes of neophyte devotees and nectar instruction, nectar devotion, tells us who they are. Uh, those who are distressed, those who are, want comfort, those who are inquisitive, and those who are, want to realize their eternal nature, their 
Brahman identity. And there are four personalities who are, exemplify those four different kinds of neophyte devotees, namely Gajendra, the elephant who was being bitten on the leg, he was distressed by a crocodile. Then we have Dhruva Maharaj, who wanted a kingdom greater than that of his great grandfather, Lord Brahma. And then we have the sages of Namasharanya, who are inquisitive to know the absolute truth or something that would be beneficial for society in general. And then we have the four Kamaras, who are situated in Brahman realization, who want to find out if there's something more. So the, Prabhupada said the perfect Brahman, like the four Kamaras, he's the perfect, he's the topmost neophyte devotee. So neophyte devotees are not something to be laughed at or scorned, but or, uh, they're actually, they go up to the level of the Brahman realization of the four Kamaras. But we have to go beyond, we're not, we may not be on the on Brahman platform right now, but still devotional service begins at the Brahman platform. In other words, we have to act on the Brahman platform. And what is that activity? We have to do our service out of love for Krishna and out of love for his representatives. Trying to do the service the best we can with care and attention. Love doesn't mean that as soon as we chant Hare Krishna, we start rolling on the ground. Or as Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, when he saw the deities, Lord Jagannath in the temple, he fainted. Uh, that's not our level of displaying love at the present moment for most of us. When some in Vrindavan, there's a good number of people there called Sahajyas. They like to get some prestige by displaying transcendental emotions or pretending that they have transcendental emotions. And some of them I've, I personally saw, they came to the Vrindavan temple, the Krishna Balaram temple. I remember one time when this lady came and this man came, and when the arti started, they started to roll on the ground and try, trying to touch the feet of the devotees. So the devotees were confused. And they went to Prabhupada and said, what should we do? There's these people who come, and they roll on the ground, and they try and touch the feet of the devotees. What should we do? So Prabhupada said, what we should do is we should kick them in the head. <laughs> he said, if they're acting ecstasy, they won't notice it. So you kick, kick them in the head. And if they're not in ecstasy, they'll get up and run out. So in any case, as a class, we're not trying to externally show transcendental emotions or show how advanced we are. But we have to act in such a way, we have to develop our faith in the scriptures so that we follow the objective of the, the revealed scriptures, namely come to the platform of devotional service and try to love Krishna by performing our services with care for, and attention. As it says in one verse in, in the Srimad Bhagavatam, Shushu Shau Sharadhanasya Vasudeva Kataruchi. Sharadhanasya Prabhupada translates as care and attention. Or Priti Porvakam in Bhagavad Gita 10.10. With enthusiasm and with consistency. So this is how we show our love for Krishna. And for the devotees, we try to cooperate with them for the purposes of Krishna, namely to help others develop love for Krishna. Therefore, we have our sadhana in the morning or in the evening with the devotees to help them develop their love for Krishna. And we go out and preach to the non-devotees to help them develop love for Krishna. Take up the process by which they can develop love for Krishna. And for the innocent, we try to help them. And for the non-devotees, we try to avoid them, uh, especially the non-devotees that we can't help and they can't help us. Now, we may not be on the second class platform, but if we act on the second class, class platform of Mandyama Adhikari, then the result is we'll gradually come to that platform, just like, because that's the platform of pure devotional service. That's the beginning of pure devotional service. Prabhupada said, what's the difference between the neophyte devotee who's acting in pure devotional service and the devotee who's advanced to pure devotional service? He said, like, the difference is between a ripe mango and an unripe mango. They're both mangoes. You can't say one is an orange, the other is a mango. No, they're both mangoes, but what, the unripe mango is not quite as sweet as the ripe mango. 
So we act in devotional service, even if we're normally on the neophyte platform, we haven't even realized we're eternal, like the Kumaras, or we're not as inquisitive as the sages of Namasharanya. We may be purely out of distress, like Gajendra, or we may want some material renumeration some way. Still, if we consistently try to act on the, on the second class platform and try to, to the best we can, sincerely try to remain on that platform, then the result is that gradually, like if, when you put the iron in the fire, it'll get hotter and hotter and hotter, and then one day it'll become like fire. So if we try to remain on that platform of consciousness and activities, then gradually we'll come to the second class platform. We'll no longer be, in, be performing devotional service out of distress. We'll advance to understanding what real comfort is, to becoming inquisitive about what the goal of life it really is, and then we'll realize our eternal identity fully and be fixed in pure devotional service to Krishna, all by the chanting of the holy name and performing pure devotional service. Now, the second class of devotees, without going into it in so much detail, but he's not so expert in, in the revealed scriptures. But he has firm faith in the scriptures and he believes in the purport that devotional service to Krishna will bring him to the highest level. At the same time, he's still undaunted with himself. Uh, but sometimes he may fail to offer arguments on the basis of revealed scriptures. But still, he's undaunted in himself that the goal of life is to obtain Krishna consciousness. Now, on the other hand, Prabhupada, in that particular chapter, he very much gives details about the first class devotee eligible for pure devotional service. It's not the devotee who's on the Uttama Adhikari platform in terms of being in ecstasy all the time or on the stage of Bhava or Prema or not even necessarily a Sakti or, or Ruchi, but he's obtained to the platform of Nisha, steadiness in devotional service. And therefore he knows he's expert in the study of the revealed scriptures. He can prevent, present arguments based on the revealed scriptures, etc. He strictly follows all the rules and regulations and therefore, and he's, he has obtained a mature determination in the matter of devotional service. And therefore, Prabhupada said, being fully trained to preach, he can become a spiritual master himself. He may not be the best spiritual master in terms of the potency of Ladini Shakti to convey mercy on others, but he's qualified because of his steadiness and his clarity in devotional service to help others at least to come to that plot, platform of liberation. And once devotees come to the platform of liberation, then their devotional service will continue unimpeded and spontaneous. They'll be able to develop devotional service even without having to, you know, following so closely the rules and regulations. Uh, that will come naturally, devotional service. But when devotional service is unnatural, and has to be done under regulations in order to be performed properly, then one has to find at least a spiritual master on the platform of eligibility for pure devotional service, who is clear on what the purpose of scripture is, and he follows the rules or regulations, and he has a mature determination in the matter of devotional service. So I'll stop there, thank you. Any questions? Hare Krishna Guru Dave. Yes. Welcome um, from Australia. Thank you, Guru Dave. Are you which country are you in? I'm in Ljubljana in Slovenia. Oh Slovenia. Okay. I can't say that name. The Ljubljan. Um so I was gonna ask uh you were saying about coming to Nishta platform. Um but before that is an art and nivriti and you know for a for Kanishta Adhikari, then an Nivriti can seem like a long call, a long road. Well, that's good. That way we won't take it so cheaply, Krishna. If we can obtain Krishna in a, in a moment, then we just think, oh, Krishna, maybe there's something better than Krishna. I mean, what do you get cheap that has some value? If someone offered you a Rolls Royce for 50 cents, 
wouldn't you doubt, you know, wouldn't you think twice about it? Wouldn't you want to take it for a test drive or something? Want to find out who's actually it's read and whose name it's registered? Wouldn't you have some doubts about someone offering you something, something which is priceless or very valuable, very cheaply? Yes? Yes, yeah. yeah. So the top, Krishna who is the source of everything, has unlimited beauty and wealth and strength and knowledge and fame and renunciation. Should take some time to, to obtain him. But the whole thing is developing a desire to obtain him. Our narthas are caused by the fact that we have a desire to obtain other things. So how can we obtain the topmost who's eternally, unless we give up our desires to obtain the, the bottomless, the, the lowest things? Hmm. To realize Krishna means we can't, we have to give up this idea that we're, we can become Krishna. If we still maintain that idea, I can become Krishna. If we realize Krishna, we'd be very disappointed. It's bad enough having to compete with everyone else in the material world trying to become Krishna. But when we meet Krishna, we'll see there's, there's no competition. Mm -hmm. Better to remain in the material world competing against everyone else because you have a chance to become better than they are. When we meet Krishna, we'll see there's no chance of becoming better than he is. We'd be very disappointed. And it's better not to be eternally remote, remote uh, return, eternally disappointed that why can't I compete against Krishna? Or is that called uh, when someone is depressed? Remorseful. Remorseful or something, I forget. Yes, remorseful, whatever, depressed. So better not to be depressed eternally, thinking if I only would have stayed in the material world, I would have been better than everyone else. And now I'm here in Krishna Loka, and I have to be humble because no one will take me seriously anyhow. Mm -hmm. So here's an opportunity in the material world to get over our competitive spirit and surrender to Krishna. And it may take some time, but then we're going after the highest prize possible. So it's worth the effort. Mm. And if we want to go quickly, we can. Uh, the problem is that we don't want to go quickly. We have too many other things to do. So gradually as we understand the value of Krishna consciousness, then gradually we'll give up some of the things that are holding us back and we'll make some progress. Mm. All right, anything else? Okay, one, one, at one at a time. You go. Mukunda Madhava. Okay. Uh, so I wanted to ask you about this. There are these people who are coming to our temples, and they uh, they are coming for a long time, and they they don't take the process. They don't follow the process, or maybe they chant some rounds, follow some principles, but they don't take it seriously. So, uh, are they making progress or are they just being offensive and they don't make progress? Well, I seriously doubt if they're being offensive. I mean, generally people don't come to the, the temple every day and shout, I hate God, I hate you all. I mean, it'd be pretty unusual. If they, sometimes people, they come to a certain level of pure devotional service and they stay there for some time. So we shouldn't discourage them, we should encourage them. We should appreciate, at least they've come to that level. Now, our conception of time is rather limited because for us, a hundred years is a long time, but our hundred years is one moment in Brahma's life. It's not even a moment in Brahma's life. In Brahma's life, he lives 311 trillion, 40 billion years, of which one second in his life is equal to approximately 90,000 of our years. So that means in one second of Brahma's life, if we live for 90 years every lifetime, then we go through a thousand births and deaths during Brahma's one second. And Brahma only lives for an exhalation of Mahavishnu. So imagine, and Mahavishnu is only a, por a, plenary, a portion of a plenary portion of a, of a plenary portion of Krishna. So imagine if you were in Krishna Loka, what time is like there? 
Now, if someone comes around for a couple of years or five years or 50 years, and we become impatient with them, it's because we don't understand what eternity is. We don't understand that even if this person was so slow in their advancement, it, it took them one second of Brahma's lifetime to go back to Godhead, it wouldn't be very much time. So we should be patient. We shouldn't be foolish, of course, we don't give people unlimited, you know, because someone's coming, everyone who comes to the temple, we treat equally, or you spend the same amount of time trying to help them advance in Krishna consciousness. But we respect anyone who's coming to take prasadam or chanting or even hearing the holy name, at least within the mind. Now, sometimes it happens that someone comes to the temple and they take advantage of the temple. So that we try to avoid. Like on the Sunday feast, someone comes with a bucket and asks you to fill the bucket up with prasadam so they can go home and eat for a week. So those type of things probably we should avoid. <laughs> but that doesn't mean that they come with a bucket and we say, well, I won't give you even a, you know, one chapati. No, we give them what they can eat or we make the arrangements. So we feed, we, we want people to take prasadam. We want people to chant the holy name. And we're happy if anyone comes. Of course, sometimes arrangements should be made the people who are coming every week just to take prasadam, there should be a special program for them where there's practically just prasadam. And for people who are more interested in our philosophy and our practice, we should have programs for them, for those who are more serious, to help them come, come to a higher level of education and commitment. And they don't have to associate with people who are less interested and less committed. So we have to make intelligent arrangements so that everyone can get some get a, some appreciation and some involvement in our in our in the process of devotional service so eventually even if in this lifetime they don't come to the higher levels of commitment and education but at least they remain in some steady platform some level of commitment hey Nigoli, did you have a question Yes, Maharaj. Um, recently, I see uh, people speak about this uh, Bhagavad Gita before uh, the original Macmillan and the uh, edited, edited one. And I don't remember what is the, should be our uh, thought about it or should I have an independent thought about it? Well, read this one Bhagavad Gita or read the other because both Bhagavad Gita is, luckily the editions both say that Krishna is God. And that's the important thing. As far as the details of the language and the clarity and the fidelity to Prabhupada's exact words, uh, that may be beyond our ability to discern which one is exactly better. But read one of them, or read both of them. And then follow them. Try to understand it, that we're Krishna's eternal servant, and that we should do service to Krishna and with the, in the association of devotees then we'll be benefited from either one of them or both, both of them. And do we know the reasons why uh, there were changes? Well, there are different reasons. And I think there is a, there's a committee working on it. Some of the reasons may be valid and some of them may not be as valid. So that's being worked on right now. For instance, the most obvious thing in the original Bhagavad Gita when Prabhupada was dictating it, some of the devotees who were taking the dictation couldn't understand what he was saying because of his accent. And therefore he said things like, you know, in the Bhagavad Gita, in the original Bhagavad Gita, there's a planet of trees. I guarantee you, if you go throughout the whole universe, you won't find any planet, only of trees. What Prabhupada was saying, there's a planet of pit trees, of ancestors. But because the devotee who couldn't was taking dictation, couldn't understand what he was saying. And th they had no experience of pit trees, the word pit tree. They thought it must have been trees. And that got into the original Bhagavad Gita. So does that mean from now until the next 10,000 years, people will be looking around for a planet of trees? So some changes are valid to be changed. Others may be more subtle, it may not have been as necessary. 
but none of the changes came out with the conclusion that Krishna is no longer God and that Balaram had to take over. Anything else? Gurudev, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear, I, we can all hear you. Okay, um, I was just wondering ab about this. I have one question that, uh, you know, sometimes when I'm, let's say I'm reading Bhagavatam and then I'm going on every day and then I become slack a little bit and then I stop and then I start again. So I just uh, wanted to bring the steadiness in my spiritual life. Uh, but So it's like ongoing. I mean, in terms of reading. Uh, but lately me and mom, we started hearing lectures every day. Uh, but yeah, I just was wondering how to bring that steadiness. I mean, I did, I did receive your email regarding this and you told me to uh, regular sadhana will bring us to steadiness. Yeah. Generally speaking, the reason why we don't take these things so seriously is because we don't get any experience from them. Just like if you had a feast and they were serving, if you like pizza and they were serving pizza and ice cream then no one would have to tell you, please go to the Sunday feast. We really want to encourage you. You should be steady at this, coming to the Sunday feast. No, we go there because we get some taste from it. So taste is a very important factor in how steady we are. So if we're reading Srimad Bhagavatam, the best thing to do is to actually read it rather than to skim over it. And we know if we're reading it, we read it and then we close the book, as I said many times, and we see what I can remember. If I can't remember what I heard, that means I didn't pay very much attention. Now, I didn't pay much attention, means that I didn't really think it was a very valuable exercise, just reading, just you know, something I, I feel guilty if I didn't do. That I don't believe this had something valuable to tell me. But if I understand that, then I'll go back and read it again until I understand what it, remember what it said, and then try to understand what it was saying. If it's actually part of my life, is this valuable for my life? Something I should apply within my life. And if we do that, and we try to apply it in our lives, and Krishna is pleased with us and gives us some experience in Krishna consciousness, then the result is that we become encouraged to read more in the, in the same way or better. And especially if it can help us in our relationships with others. If hearing Bhagavad Gita, Srimad Bhagavatam, Chaitanya Charitamrita, we improve in our relationships with others, they become more loving and more caring, more understanding. Then the result is that we'll see the Bhagavad Gita is a very valuable book because that's what ultimately everyone's looking for is love and relationships. And if we don't realize that that's what the Bhagavad Gita is about, that's what Srimad Bhagavatam is about, Chaitanya Charitamrita, then we'll see it's some kind of just philosophical book, but not really very much relevance to my life or my aspirations. And therefore I'll read it rather mechanically and I won't have any taste for it. Or will I understand it? How can I apply it? Or will I apply it in my relationships with others and develop love and appreciation for them? All right, so I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you for your association. We look forward to seeing you all again. Grandra Shimad Bhagavad Gita. Thank you very much, Guru Maharaj. The Propa Kita. Hare Krishna. 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 Nice to, nice to see you. Yes, I will contact you. No problem. Okay. Hare Krishna.